Wollongong. Beautiful place, Wollongong. Now, you might notice I've got a funny accent as well. I didn't pick that up in Wollongong. Just clear that up right from the start. I also spent some of my formative years in Geelong. <laughs> That's where I got the accent from. Now, Wollongong has a very proud history of making stuff, making things, manufacturing things. For example, a copper refinery built over 100 years ago based on the most advanced technology of the time to make the best copper of the time. And then further developed through further advances in technology to make better and better copper, to take silver and recover silver. And somewhere along the line, someone lost contact between advances in science and technology and making things. And guess what? It doesn't exist anymore. Closed down a few years ago. The stack was blown up, demolished in February last year. Stack's not coming back. That industry's not coming back. And all is because one of the important things we changed is the drive towards making lots of things, lower cost, make it faster, make it cheaper. Well, you know, as that's happening around the country, of course, there are other opportunities that are emerging. Other opportunities in fabrication and manufacturing that are not about mass manufacturing, they're about localized, dynamic, versatile manufacturing, customized structures, and one of those is printing parts for bodies. Because we're, none of us are the same, right? It's all got to be customized. It's got to be customized, whether it's inside or outside. These two guys might look the same. But they're not. I, I know both these guys. Or I knew both these guys. And they're not the same. I worked very closely with one of them. They're identical twins, but in fact, they're mirror images. One parts his hair on one side. One parts his hair on the other side. One's left-handed. One's right-handed. One's got his heart on one side. One's got his heart on the other side. And can you believe that their mother gave them names that are mirror images? <laughs> Seriously. Where do you get that from? This is weird. You know? And that's not all these guys. You know, they both work on chiral chemistry, mirror image chemistry. And one works in the, in the southern hemisphere and one works in the northern hemisphere. The story goes on, but it's bizarre. But I, make, I think I'm getting the point of it, right? Things have got to be customized. We're all different. No matter how similar we look, we're all different. And if you're going to make things for bodies, we've got to have customized and very sophisticated manufacturing. We need to be able to distribute mechanical, electrical, chemical, and biological properties in three dimensions if we're going to build things that effectively communicate and integrate with living systems. So could we do that? Could we, could we actually imagine doing that? Coming out of this mass manufacturing mentality, this mass manufacturing culture we've had for several decades, could we imagine quickly turning that around and doing things like printing things for bodies? Well, yes, we could, and we can, and in fact, we are. And the reason is that despite all of what was happening in, in manufacturing and traditional industries, Researchers had been taking the bit between the teeth and developing new materials, amazing new materials, by delving into the nano world. Now, we've heard a lot about carbon today. Now, I'm sorry, Tony, but I think carbon's really bloody boring, right? You know, as a materials chemist 20 years ago, you would have thought carbon would be exciting today? Come on. And look at what we've heard about carbon today. It is exciting. And to all of my colleagues who I've abused over the years, I'm converted. I'm wearing the bloody shirt. Come on. I'm converted. I believe that carbon is exciting. And it's only one of those materials we've discovered in the nano world over the last 20 years or so that are really exciting materials. Just by taking that simple composition and controlling the size, we can control mechanical properties and electrical properties and chemical and biological properties on those very simple structures. Now, what else has been happening in research laboratories around the world? You've Basis probably heard also. about this advent of 3D printing, you know, where you can take materials now and build up very sophisticated structures layer by layer. Could be a metal, like titanium here, where we're building up very complex things, sintering that as we build it, and then we can take away this beautiful three-dimensional structure. Now, you can't do things like this with traditional manufacturing because here, whether it's a metal or whether it's a polymer or a soft material that we might want for biological applications, we can build very sophisticated structures. They can be multidimensional in terms of size features throughout that structure. They can be multi-compositional in terms of distributing those key properties, mechanical, electrical, chemical, and biological throughout these very sophisticated structures. So yes, we, we can print parts for bodies. It's already happening. 
People are taking three-dimensional printing with conventional materials in some instances, like titanium here, to print that uh, jaw implant. Titanium is also used to print customized knee implants, for example. Or we could take polymer materials providing structural support for wearable prosthetics. Perfect fit because they're customized, and that fit is important for effective and efficient performance. What about if we wanted to add a little bit more functionality to those uh, printed parts for bodies? In this story, this work we did with Professor Michael Coote, who's an eye surgeon, and Michael's implanted, I'm sure, many, many glaucoma drainage implants over the years, over decades, and always thought about different ways that you could improve those drainage implants, to make them more effective in the treatment of the pressure that builds up from glaucoma. When I met Michael, and he was telling me about what he did, and he was saying how he loved all, had all these different designs, and he would love to get these great designs, made, but you couldn't do it with traditional manufacturing. So here we've got not just 20 years of material science knowledge and 20 years of new fabrication approaches, there's 20 years of ideas locked up because of this shift to mass manufacturing that now we can grab and we can implement very quickly. And we were able to take Michael's designs, you know, sketched on the, the beer coaster like we all do, uh, take those designs, put them into three-dimensional designs and create those structures for his initial animal implants within a matter of weeks. So it's an exciting time. But, you know, things are changing in terms of manufacturing, but what an exciting time to do things quickly through these uh, advances all colliding uh, just at this point in time. Let's go up another notch in terms of complexity uh, and functionality. Cartilage regeneration is very important. It's important if you're young and you happen to get it damaged uh, during a sports injury, uh, but it's important to all of us because eventually it wears out. So about 50% of people over 65 uh, will experience osteoarthritis associated with uh, the degeneration of, of your cartilage. The trouble is that that age is getting younger and younger every year because people are getting heavier and heavier. So this is a real critical issue. So how, how we, might we tackle this idea of cartilage regeneration? Working with uh, Professor Peter Chung, an orthopedic surgeon at St. Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne, uh, one possible treatment is to take the, the patient's own stem cells and to use those to turn it back into cells that can facilitate cartilage regeneration and to put those back into the injury. However, it's known that that's going to be, have to be contained with some mechanical support in an appropriate material which is customised to that defect for that potential clinical treatment to work. So we've worked with Peter and using a, a naturally occurring material, Kyrazan, I think it's been referred to today already. It's extracted from crab shells. What's important about it, it, it has some chemical moieties that you find in, in conventional cartilage. So it has some chemistry that works in our favor. We've also figured out ways to 3D print it where we can control the dimensions of that implant and the porosity of it so as we can distribute the mechanical properties appropriately. And already this has proven very successful in animal studies. Taking this this 3D printed structure as the support and delivering the stem cells uh, into that defect. But we continue to refine the process. We would like to be able to print that structure with the cells contained in it during printing. Cartizan is not appropriate for that, but another naturally occurring material, gelatin, which is just derived from collagen, uh, gelatin is very appropriate. It's compatible with the cells, and it has the properties that we need to do the 3D printing to build those 3D structures. So we managed to do that. We did compromise a little bit in mechanical properties. And so while the animal studies on this material and these 3D structures are continuing, challenges have been thrown back to the people in the laboratory concerned more with the machinery that we use for 3D printing. And one of the challenges, can we print using a coaxial printer. Could we have the stem cells in the core of this 3D printed structure, the, the core of the struts of that structure, and protect it with another polymer that's where we can manipulate the mechanical properties as we build the structure up? So this project only took a matter of months to design and build and demonstrate this three-dimensional printer which was capable of coaxial, coaxial structures and the ability to put 
Uh, within that structure are the stem cells or other growth factors and proteins, or maybe even some of the conductors we would like, like our graphene, coming back to graphene, some of the conductors we would like to help stimulate different types of tissue regeneration. A further advance on that hardware is a handheld biopen. This puts the ability to fill or sort of sculpt into that defect back in the hands of the surgeon. This biopen has obviously been a very multidisciplined project. It has involved clinicians, stem cell biologists, materials chemists, uh, and of course, mechatronic engineers. The important thing about these advances in hardware is all of them are facilitated by current hardware. All of these new printers are created using existing three-dimensional printing. So printers printing printers. So again, it's not just the collision of all this knowledge that's accelerating the progress, but it's the actual technologies that we have that can take ideas into innovations very quickly. And we continue to refine the materials. I've mentioned chitosan, I've mentioned gelatin already. Let me mention another one, alginate, which comes from seaweed. And we continue to look at opportunities to create those materials for the emerging 3D bioprinting area. You might think you might need to synthesize them all in a laboratory. All of these are naturally occurring. The alginate comes from seaweed. So we work with what I call a precision seaweed farmer. Dr. Pierre Winberg and Fina Shell Systems. And, and Pierre is very careful with the diet of these seaweeds, what she feeds them when. And she's also very careful about when she harvests them and how she extracts these important biomolecules from them. That gives us a biomaterial with exquisite properties, which is suitable for 3D bioprinting. There's another property of those types of polysaccharides like alginate, which I find fascinating. They're, they're sheer thinning. And that's, been able, that's enabled us to take our printing capability to a new level, printing cells capability to a new level. Sheer thinning means it, it has a certain viscosity, so it's like honey, when we've got the cells in the ink, in that ink reservoir, it's like honey, so the cells stay suspended, they don't settle out. And then with inkjet printing, which is a very precise printing technique, as we expose the cell to the shear going through that print head, it becomes like water. So it's, it experiences almost no pressure. And so you get very high survivability. And then to complete the picture, it gets to the other side, gets to the other side of that printing sequence and reforms like honey. And so you can build up these nice structures where you can, with exquisite resolution, almost unicellular resolution, put particular cells where you want them, surround them with other cells, surround them with other electrical conductors, like our graphene, to do electrical stimulation. That's important, not just for getting closer to practical applications, like the cartilage regeneration, or with the conductors, uh, systems for nerve and muscle regeneration, or a very complex project we're involved in uh, with the neurologist, which is an implant into the brain for epilepsy detection and control. That's what's driving us towards systems like this. But what it's also doing is opening up the opportunity for fundamental experiments, fundamental explorations in stem cell biology that just weren't possible a few years ago. So that's exciting. It's not just getting closer to applications, it's helping us understand the fundamental biology through building systems that are enabling uh, 3D printing uh, parts for bodies. So we can do it. We can print parts for bodies. We can actually take printers where we can distribute mechanical, electrical, chemical, and biological activity in three dimensions, and they can make them highly personalized. And they're starting to be recognized. They're starting to be established in clinical settings. We have a small laboratory at St. Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne where clinicians every day are becoming more familiar and certainly helping to develop the next generation of printers for 3D printing uh, parts for bodies. So it's an exciting time that we're living in. Here we are standing as sort of mass manufacturing collapses around us. And here we are realizing that there's amazing opportunities. There's amazing opportunities to customize things, to develop new manufacturing approaches and new business models that enable manufacturing to be dynamic, to be flexible, to be able to do things with new materials as they emerge, to put them into sophisticated devices like we've just talked about. And 3D printing, of course, is having 
a much wider impact than just on printing parts for bodies. It's involved in customized tooling, customized jewelry. You can do 3D printed food, 3D printed wearables, all sorts of things it's having an impact on. But I don't think there will be an area like 3D printing parts for bodies where it will have such a, a profound impact, an ongoing and a lasting impact on all of our lives and in all of the things that we do. And the great thing about it, to put it in general terms, is that 3D printing is overcoming the limitations of mass manufacture and it's putting the ability to create back in the hands of the creative. Thank you. <laughs>